Colonel, it's great to have you back here at Weltworth Daily. How have you been? Everything okay in the United States? Yes. Well, I must admit that listening to your schwizdarsh is a little difficult. So it's a good thing we're speaking English, because I've only gotten every third word or so. Well, I mean, this is absolutely depressing for me, what you have just said now, because I tried to use my best high German, which has been identified by U.S. Swiss German. I'm already annihilated at the beginning of our program. I'm so sorry. I remember in school, having to learn a little bit of the Schwiz Deutsche. It was Wubo and Gipfel is very famous in German. Something like that. So it was a might as well spoke in Greek. Well, this is actually one of our secrets to preserve our dialect in order to scare off the Germans. But please don't tell it to the Germans. Well, they're easily scared these days. Yeah. What's your relationship to Switzerland, by the way? You've ever been to Switzerland? Do you know the country a little bit? Just a little bit. I visited Luth Town and drove through the country. This is 1,978. That's my last real visit to Switzerland. So, I would like to have seen more, but I didn't have much time. I was a young lieutenant serving in Germany. Okay, I didn't have much time. Well, these were the glorious old days. Switzerland has changed a lot, not always to the better. Well, let's start it off here. Let's begin before we switch to the Middle East. Let's talk a bit first, an update on the Ukraine war. It has disappeared from the headlines. Interesting enough. I mean, the media do not write much about Ukraine anymore. Can you give us a short update of what's happening in the Ukraine right now? Well, I think it's somewhat beneficial to Washington that it has managed to redirect media attention to Israel because things have gone very badly for Washington and obviously its puppet regime in Kiev. Right now, the Russians have moved forward, but at a very deliberate pace, seeking to avoid any casualties. They're making significant progress. Near Advika, I think, is the name of the town that has turned into something of a Bakhmut for the Ukrainian forces that are there. At the same time, they're moving north and west, I think, with the objective of surrounding and taking Kharkov in the next days or weeks. All of this is being very carefully orchestrated, deliberately done. There are no mad dashes forward. Again, someone asked me, well, why hasn't Putin and the Russian military overwhelmed all of Ukraine? You keep saying they can do it? Well, obviously they can do it. But there are no hurry to try and govern large numbers of Ukrainians. The areas that they sit in are historically Russian. And as far as the Russians are concerned, those areas from Odessa to Kharkov should be Russian again. But they're not particularly enthusiastic about governing tough-minded Ukrainians that want nothing to do with Russia. What Moscow wants is a settlement and ends of this thing. And we, of course, are standing in the way. So the question is, what happens in Europe? When do European governments come to their senses and put an end to this tragedy in Ukraine? But as far as the Americans are concerned, they're sending more money. But I think that's simply designed to keep this regime on life support, at least until the election, to maintain the facade that there is some element of legitimacy to it and some measure of success when there has been none. Do you see light at the end of the tunnel as far as Ukraine is concerned? Are we any step closer to an agreement due to the fact that militarily the facts are speaking more clearly every day? Not really. Not in Washington. I've said this many times. Europeans need to understand that Washington cannot end this conflict. First of all, why would Moscow believe anything we said? Why would they trust anything that we signed on to? I think this is really a matter for the states that border Russia and Ukraine, and particularly the Central East European countries. Berlin, Budapest, Warsaw. They can play a very important role in bring this tragedy to an end. 
I think Paris, to some extent, can contribute, but I don't see London being more credible than we are given their behavior. So it's a matter of the people that live closest to this have to come to terms with the reality that this cannot go on if they want Ukraine to exist at all. We think that half the population of Ukraine is either dead or left, moved out of the country. What future does Ukraine have under these circumstances? If it's to have any future at all, it needs to end. Is the United States government losing interest in Ukraine? Are we seeing a scenario, as we have witnessed in Afghanistan, where you could say in the middle of the night, the Americans ran off and just left Afghanistan? Do you see any signs that the United States have this Saigon Afghanistan scenario at the moment? Yes, and I've tried to remind people repeatedly that we in the British are quite similar in that we are primarily aerospace and maritime powers. When things don't go our way, when our mistakes have been made, we simply fly and sail away. And someone asked what would happen in Ukraine. I said this months ago. I said, eventually, it will end up like Vietnam. We'll simply leave. We'll change the subject. And remember, most Americans pay remarkably little attention to what happens beyond their borders. This is a huge problem for us. But a Spanish general staff officer once said to me when I was at Supreme Headquarters and Powers Europe, said, Colonel McGregor, the United States is not a country. It's not a nation. It's a planet. You live on it. He was absolutely correct. This is what gets us into trouble, because Americans are concerned with what happens in their own country, which means a small, well-financed elite in Washington can steer the ship from state pretty much any direction it wants to go. And most Americans don't want anything to do with these wars or interventions or conflicts. They're happy to cheer at the beginning. They rapidly lose interest, and it's left in the hands of this small ruling elite to decide what to do. This really needs to stop in our country. But stopping it is not an easy thing to do. We've been doing this thing for what? Seventy. 80 years since the end of the Second World War. Very important, what you're saying, and especially for our audience, and even some politicians who are watching this program, because probably in Europe, but not many people are really aware of the fact that at the end of the day, they have to go for a settlement that they cannot rely on the Americans. Solely. But let's move now on to another sphere of conflict which has always, which has almost been a little bit forgotten, the Middle East. I mean, a very tense situation at the moment. Let's walk through the events. I would be very curious to hear your analysis. Let's go back to October 7th, this a hence attack from these Hamas terrorists. From your military experience, what exactly happened on this day? Was this a terrorist attack on a new scale? Something we haven't witnessed before? To me, it felt like a horror movie in reality, but you are a much more hard-boiled personality than I am. What does a military expert with your tone age, with your expertise, say? What happened on the 7th of October? Well, I should point out that I was in Israel three years ago, in February of 2020, and I had the opportunity because I was a guest of the IDF Chief of Staff to visit the Gaza Front, so to say. I saw the barriers. I saw the walls. I saw how the Israelis had constructed what I thought was a very effective and tightly organized security system. To be perfectly blunt with you, I'm somewhat surprised by the entire thing. It seems almost incomprehensible to me that the Hamas fighters could have broken through as suddenly and as easily as they did without two things. One is a shameless incompetence, for which I saw no evidence when I was in Israel, or someone deliberately let them in. It's just hard for me to believe that Hamas was quite that clever, because it's very difficult in this very small area. 
it's only 140 square miles. The Israelis really understood what was happening inside of it. And, of course, you had the Egyptians on the other side, equally concerned about what Hamas could do and its potential to destabilize the region, also providing information and intelligence to the Israelis. I think the Israelis.